content going for you. Um, hey, listen, we're going to just set up some chairs up here. Uh, I've noticed something. We've noticed a little thread. It's great that we've got a DJ on stage. We've noticed a little thread through today's speeches. Everyone keeps dropping lyrics. We've had Eminem. We've got Eminem? It's not quite, because Eminem said, so the FCC won't let me be. But we think that should be changed to, so the SEC won't let me be, or let me be me, so let me see. Right? Exactly. And we just had, for the older people in the audience, and if you're not sure who this person is, Google exists, uh, Nana Cherry's man-child. So we've already had that. Uh, I'm sure we're going to find lots and lots and lots of new songs as we go through the day. Um, we're almost challenging our speakers now to drop lyrics without us noticing. Um, are we all set with the chairs? We're almost there. We've got two more chairs to come out. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to keep this moving right along for you. Um, as you've noticed, we've got lots of chairs here, which means we've got lots of experts coming out on stage. It's going to be amazing. But I'm not going to introduce every single one of those people, largely because I'm lazy and also because I can't remember all of their names. But I am going to introduce the one and the only. Uh, please come to the stage and please give him a warm, warm round of applause. Chris Snook, ladies and gentlemen. All right, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear me. That's awesome. How are we doing, Las Vegas? <laughs> I can't remember all your names. All right, I'm going to be the hamburger don't. under the lights here. You guys, I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so behave. Now, uh, we're going to put eight megabytes of content in a one megabyte block over this one, and I think you're going to enjoy it. So what I'm going to do is uh, talk about the current and future rate of adoption as it relates to this industry of ours. And we've got some great use cases and panelists that we'll bring up here in a second. Um, but I'm going to warm you up because I believe in context before content. We've got enough content these days, don't we? So I'd like to give you a little bit, if you'll permit me to do that, uh, context. Um, you may disagree with some of these statements. That's, that's fine. I think healthy debate's good. Some of these, I think, might illuminate uh, some things for you in a way you haven't seen before. And so um, what I know is after 19 years of being an early stage entrepreneur and investor that uh, dogs like bones, the sky is blue, and adoption matters. And if you follow any futurists like I do, you may have heard of a guy named Gerd Leonhard. He's a good friend of ours um, out of Switzerland, travels all over. But he, he had this statement a couple years back. And if you think about Las Vegas and where we all are today in this massive, amazing hotel at Aria that we're staying in, if you go back 300 years to 1718, almost 1719, try and picture what it would look like if you and I were st here then. It'd be a lot of dirt, a lot of sand, no buildings. We probably slept outside last night and tried to avoid getting eaten by a coyote. Yeah? We probably dressed like these two individuals here if we were in the colonial times, even though we weren't settled out here yet. Imagine if 20 years from now, you went from that reality to this. Smartphones, things beeping at us, tweeting, texting in real time. But last night or 20 years, you know, today, if we went out 20 years forward, we went from colonial experience to what we have today. How would you feel? Somebody in the front row. How would you feel? A little freaked out. You, you'd really not feel like you were on the same planet, would you? Now, here's the hardest part to think about to contextualize what Gerd's saying here. Whatever you think complexity looks like today, all the stuff we don't know how to deal with in our life, all the places our data is that we don't know, all the things that remarket to us that we don't even remember how we got on that list, the political campaigns that text us five times this week that we didn't give our number to, compound that by 300 years and that's how we will feel in 2038. Crazy. Now, inside of that, We've got these different things happening, right? We've all heard about 3D printing, yes? We've all heard about VR, yes? And all these things went through their hype cycles and their trough of disillusionments, yes? And when we think about mobility and we think about smartphones, 
most of what we've experienced the last four or five years, 10 years, wouldn't even have been possible without this being in billions of people's hands. So even though the technology and the ideas were there, they couldn't scale. And where we kind of are today is as you look at these two, I'm gonna use my pointer thing here since they gave me this. If you look at these, these are different potential future scenarios that he talks about. And so you'll see things like Money 2.0, Circular Economy, Autonomous Vehicles, Smart Cities, some of the stuff we're gonna talk about with the panelists today, some of the things that you guys are working on. And you'll see blockchain in here as well. And so what we're gonna talk about is how these enablers like blockchain and, and Hashgraph and some of these other things are causing adoption to potentially be the timing be right. Um, another way to think about it is we live in a token economy and not in the sense of currencies or tokens or uh, you know, smart contracts. A token economy is where we turn everything that is an atom into a bit and we arbitrage it. A token economy is data as the underlying fundamental asset of value that needs to be the raw material, as it were. And so it requires new paradigms and new business models. If you didn't see the Cisco study from uh, about a year ago, in 2018, how many know what a zettabyte is? Not too many? It's a lot. How many know what a gigabyte is? Most of us. 400 zettabytes is the equivalent of 400 trillion gigabytes. Now let's put that in something that we can compound. It's about noon, which means today we've already generated close to 600 billion gigabytes worth of data exhaust as humanity. Put that onto an individual basis. What that means is while you and I are sleeping and walking around, each one of us is responsible every 10 minutes for a gigabyte of data exhaust. Now what is data exhaust? It's the waste. It's the thing we do not do anything with. This number is 2018's number. What do you think 2019 is going to look like? Come on. You awake out there? It's going to be bigger, won't it? Now, when we talk about things in paradigm shifts like 50% of the jobs are going to go away and the 50% of the new jobs we haven't even thought of yet that will be here in five to ten years, we need to reskill. We need some of these big macro issues that are opportunities but also challenges. One of the things that has been thought about, right, is the political side of things is, oh, do we have to give everybody a universal income? Well, I'm going to posit that not a political statement. That's the wrong way to think about it. If we're all kicking off 400 trillion gigabytes worth of data today, and that's going to compound tomorrow and the next day and the next year, don't we have a universal value inherently? Since 1% to 2% of that 2018 number was cultivated into insights that companies like Amazon and Apple could use, and we have our first $2 trillion market cap companies this year. What could happen if we move the needle on another 1%? So start thinking about your business that way. And as Churchill said, the further you look backwards, the farther you'll see ahead. We're going to do a little of that today as well. But here's what we look backwards at as, as far as adoption goes. Notice the graph here, how it, how it has changed over time, right? Telephone kind of went out, got a little flat, went up, got a little flat, TV, electricity. See how these went like this? But look at the last 20, 30 years of innovation and adoption rates. What do they all have in common? They're straight up. They either go or they don't. You can see that? Here's us right here, crypto. See this little orange line? 2010, 10-year anniversary of Satoshi's white paper yesterday, yeah? So it kind of went out like this. You know, all the Mt. Gox stuff, all that happened in here, blip, blip, blip. And then last year went bonkers on speculation and, and, and things like that. But look at how small it is compared to these other ones. We're at the early stage, but are we heading in the right direction? Yes? But there's risk because if this, if this direction is purely speculative, which it always has to be in the beginning, but it doesn't start to get traction, it doesn't start to get real adoption, utility adoption, use cases that are enterprise level, then ultimately it either goes flat or it disappears. Now, I don't think any of us are in this room because we think it's going to disappear, but it's important for us to focus on the right thing. So what is the right thing? What does every business need that it can't survive without? That's a question, by the way. Good. You guys are getting good. You're warming up. Customers. It needs cash, but cash is an output right, from having customers that pay you. How uh, loyal are customers today versus 10 years ago? 
they're as promiscuous as ever, aren't they? So if we put the customer in the center of our business, regardless of what our technology is, that might be a good thing, but it's also the only thing that matters right now because there's not a product that you and I have today in any industry that couldn't be knocked off. Forget the outliers of like a patented drug technology that costs billions of dollars to create, right? But in most markets, if you're a bank, you come up with an interest rate today, everybody you compete with knocked it off tomorrow. There's nothing that isn't commoditized today. The, the same stuff's made in every factory. And so if we can focus on our customer and not do things like this, because sometimes we focus on our customer, we reward them, but it's not necessarily what the customer wanted to be rewarded with. <laughs> hey, thanks for being our customer. Oops. Right? Moments of truth, empathy mapping, touch points. How many of you have done customer journey mapping, things like that? We're not going to get into that today, but things you should be thinking about as it relates to adoption so that you can have this kind of experience with your customer, regardless of what it is. Adoption lies at this point convergent right here of optimal reliability around our current customer experience and innovating that customer experience in real time. So in digital sense, Travis Wright and I, who I know a lot of you have met, we wrote a lot about this, um, but that's where adoption lies. So let's talk about customer gains versus capital gains and the fact that human beings think in pictures. Some of you, when I say the word blockchain or Bitcoin, this is what you see because you are rapidly trying to consume as much knowledge as you can. Some of you, right, feel like this right? Just trying to keep your mouth closed and hold on for dear life. Some of you are like, huh? Huh? I thought I learned it all already. And some of you see this. I saw this last night, I think, actually, on the strip a couple, couple times, right? So we all have a different picture when we say things like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. How many of you have a relative that doesn't understand what you do? How many of you, how many of them see this? And you're like, no, I'm not a criminal, I swear. I'm actually doing life-changing stuff. So pictures matter, and the picture I want to give you is that as an industry, we have to focus on business model reinvention before we focus on the technology itself. Tokenomics is not about cryptocurrency, right? It is the study of tokenized ecosystems. Where is data being tokenized? Where is it being put into a container and then transacted with? Where is it being manipulated? Where is it becoming programmable money, smart everything? Right? Where is it providing increased security? So the study of tokenomics is the study of new money supplies as they relate to the existing money supplies. M1, M2, M3, for those who are Federal Reserve, Fiat, uh, Fractional Reserve you know, experts. But now M4, M5, M6, the crypto equivalents that are not debt driven, but that are minted or coded into existence, things that, that we talk about in tokenomics. Blockchain, again, we could all debate what it is. Um, it's not an AI, it's not a decisioning tool, it's not a compute platform. Blockchain is a tamper-evident storage medium with a consensus mechanism. There's several, as most of you are aware of. Why is that important? Because blockchain applications, the layer above that, is what gives that consensus-driven storage medium that is tamper-evident and immutable a business logic. This is where it can become more useful. And then there's protocols and things like that that many of you are developing on. I'm only doing this for those in the room who may not have their 101 up to date yet. But here's what really matters, is infrastructure and architecture around these solutions, around your business model. Are you an infrastructure? Are you a protocol? Are you an app play? Where are you at in the timing of the market as it relates to that? And are you enabling orders of magnitude difference in the business models you're trying to impact or the industries you are? If you're not solving a 10,000 to one reduction in correspondence or a 100 to one reduction in cost, do something else because someone will eat your lunch tomorrow. Blockchain is not a silver bullet, and if you spend money and it doesn't do those kind of order of magnitude difference, it's a bad investment, right? Currency versus money, some level setting here. What's the difference when, when, when Jamie Dimon says Bitcoin isn't real and everybody gets ticked off, right? He's not wrong. It's different than fiat. Fiat's not real either. It's just backed up by $800 billion worth of defense spending in this country and a rule of law. Cryptos are backed up by code. What makes them real is the belief. Belief is not believing that we bought it at 20 and it's you know, gonna come back because we don't wanna lose our house or our credit. Belief is I'm building something because I understand fundamentally the utility that it has and how it will shape the world for nine billion people in a different way than what we have right now, which is not equitable. Belief is building stuff. It's not speculating, it's not hedging. That's interesting. That's a way to make money, but that's not belief. Right? Tokens are real. 
Tokens are real. They represent a store of value, a relationship for future delivery of a service or a contract. They're real. They contain stuff. All right, let's bring up the panelists. What I'm going to do is do my best to rapid fire about four or five minutes each of these gentlemen so you understand what they're working on, where they're at, what adoption means to them individually and in their business and maybe in the industries that they're impacting. And we've got a, a, a very diverse group. So are they ready? I'm going to bring up Michael Proper. Take the first chair, sir, please. Michael Proper is the CEO chairman of Clear, your title sponsor for this phenomenal event. Give him a hand. And after him, John Hardigan, EVP of strategy at Intiva Health. Yen Passbowl from the GCC group, GCC 3D group, CEO, founder. Sebastian Hino from Renault Innovation and Moby. Jeff Burton, co-founder of Electronic Arts and a partner and associate with the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And last but certainly not least, everybody's favorite rock star, Grant Cohen, Chief of Product at FCFL. So, Michael, we're going to start with you. Oh, hi. Wow, this is weird. I'm going to back up because I don't want to be all tile in your personal space. All right, so, Michael, um, Clear is a 10-year in the making, amazing company with way too much to try and cover in four minutes. But, interestingly, this week, many of these people may have seen IBM made an acquisition that was the largest software acquisition ever, 34 billion of Red Hat. It validated open source in a way that is a really interesting thing. It's all fresh, but you've been on the forefront of open source, of infrastructure redesign, and we're going to talk about you know the bonanza and where you're currently at with Clear, but just high level, what does this mean from your perspective as it relates to adoption of open source and then possibility for not only what Clear is working on, but other things that are decentralized in nature? It, it means a lot. Um, the reality is 10 years ago when we originally got into this, we were actually concerned if open source would actually be taken as a viable offering. Because without open source being taken as a viable reality, blockchain wouldn't exist today. And majority of the infrastructure that we all use as humans is actually built on this open source. But to adopt it as a business model like Red Hat did and many others have done was a big risk long ago. Um, and long ago meaning 10 years, 20 years? It, yeah, 10, 20 years ago it was... Not real was, long, but long 20 long. years ago was almost unheard of, but people were deforming. But 10 years ago it was very big risk. We looked at the technology and just from a features and functions and scale and standards, it really made a lot of sense. Uh, we actually build what is called ClearOS on top of Red Hat and have, have done for the last decade. Um, plus, um, it actually came out of Carnegie Mellon in 2000 um, and bumped into this technology in 2005 and then basically innovated on it. So think about Red Hat, but instead of a black screen with command line, you basically have a web-based interface with a marketplace with an ecosystem that can actually be sent in a decentralized approach instead of a centralized approach. So I think that the acquisition of IBM, of Red Hat f from IBM was a very intelligent one. Um, I, for those that don't know, in 2014, the United States actually tapped IBM to build a, I, I can't say that it's a currency platform for the United States government, but there's definitely a lot of work that's going into it. And I believe that this asset purchase was a very um, strategic position for the future. Four billion in revenue, 34 billion at exit, $10 billion bigger than any other software acquisition to date. Um, and regardless of current market conditions or not, that's a premium. And, uh, and, and so it's a signal. So you mentioned ClearOS. ClearOS for the last uh, two years, correct me where I'm wrong, is, is one of your products. There's a lot of things that you guys do. ClearOS is your operating system. It's been deployed on every HPE server for the last two years. Is that right? As a pre-installed... Yeah, so that's a massive relationship that we have where Hewlett Packard Enterprise pre-installs on all Gen 9 and Gen 10 servers worldwide. Um, they haven't done that with anybody else, not with Red Hat, not with Microsoft. Um, and so it's a very humbling opportunity to work with them, but ClearOS also works on any x86 or MIPS or ARM-based technology in the world. So there's over 400, 470,000 deployments today. Um, but the reality is you've got to think about it. It's all about decentralization. How do you get these systems into the world at scale, at mass delivery, 
with very simple complexity. And that's what we're focused on, is that usability, very, very secure and very, very affordable. Those are hard boxes to check. Um, and we believe it's actually much harder than what Red Hat's done. And I think what Red Hat's core business model was or is, we, it's about 20% of ours. So we do, there's much broader reach. And that's the beauty of open source. You can do a lot with a little if you intelligently integrate that technology. And ultimately, mankind in general benefits from it. As long as the folks that are leveraging open source don't do it in such a way where it, um, it hurts the rest of the market or it charges too much to the consumer. So one of the things, uh, while we wind up your, your kind of quick level setting intro is, uh, you guys are, um, you made an announcement on the 12th out of, out of New Zealand where the foundation is um, and where you spent two years uh, living and working there um, that announced your bonanza, essentially your, your strategy for, for driving adoption around both clear token as well as all the uh, nodes and the software and the different things you can buy with it. And you were, uh, last week I was out at your offices in Salt Lake and I think you showed me a screen and you were adding about 2,300 new uh, users and roughly 70% of those were wallet conversions on a daily basis. Yesterday you told me it was 3,700, so that's going in the right direction. Everyone here, whether you realize it or not, in that beautiful box that World CryptoCon gave you, which is better than any badge I've seen in 22 conferences this, mm -hmm. uh, this year, um, there was a green ticket in there. And let's talk about that ticket just so people know what to do with it. Essentially, you are giving away uh, what equates to essentially one Ethereum worth of um, ticket drops into the Bonanza. And each Bonanza basically has a different day. And I'll let you kind of tell them exactly what it is. But I open up a wallet. I drop that in. I'm immediately going to get one uh, ticket. And then, the, then manually, uh, the team at, at the home office will add nine more over the next day or so. And I can put those tickets on days of the month starting today, and I can be airdropped clear token yep. that then I could use to potentially offset the cost of a new HP server or HODL, or I could do whatever. But what's the strategy behind that as it relates to your st statement just a minute ago? Uh, it's, it's very important for us to share in all of this. And so before kind of the, the, the sets of waves that will come in around disclosing what we've been building, how we've been building it, it's important for the world to actually get this. So. Um, I think a really good example was Bitcoin with what they did where they basically, in a, in a way, they gamified how you actually get Bitcoins. But I'd say a large population of the world couldn't figure out how to actually get the miners up and going. So it goes to a small few. We believe that every citizen of every nation on their Independence Day should have the right and opportunity to be able to get in on this without a lot of complexity. Literally. Create a simple account by one of your other existing accounts. Create a wallet that's your wallet with your private keys and then get these tokens so that the world can actually share before these waves start coming in. Um, it's very important for awareness and that's basically the reasons why we did it. Um, it's also important to note that the reason it was launched in New Zealand on the 12th, I believe that New Zealand and other countries that actually have open laws, specifically around strong copyright, and around um, software patent laws that don't stifle innovation, such as in New Zealand, there is no software patent law. The precedent that that set actually created the ecosystem that we all now live in. I don't think a lot of people understand that or realize how important and invaluable countries are that create regulation that actually drive innovation. And so if, you, if you're either in the decision-making process of financial regulators or country, you know, process of building regulation, think through um, why companies or organizations or ecosystems could build from that environment. So, anyway. Excellent. Well, it's a good intro. And for those who are looking for more, you can go to clearcenter.com and, and you can find out a lot about what they're doing in energy and nodes and how all this stuff comes together. And we're going to get to the panel and we'll have some more comments with you. John, um, thanks for being here. You are the Sandcastle 2018 uh, winner from uh, Grand Cayman, where we had our World Tokenomic Forum Annual Summit. Yeah. And, uh, and so what we want to find out is, 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 is what you're up to now, because that was in May, which is basically six years in this business. Um, and you are tackling uh, the healthcare industry, but I'm going to kind of let you talk about what you mean by that as it, as it relates to how you focused in on a specific opportunity where you felt like you could drive adoption and then what we're doing today. I'll sure. pepper back and forth. So. Sure. So uh, just to give you, uh, Intiva Health um, is uh, my company, uh, co-founder and uh, EVP of strategy. Uh, 
So everybody in this room has experienced uh, the healthcare system on one level or another, whether you're a professional or whether you're a patient. And we all know that it is an extremely inefficient system, right? You've, I mean, how many times do you have to fill out paperwork when you go to a doctor's office and you think, you got to be kidding me, right? Well, that points to, and, and then also obviously the expense, you know, the $10 Tylenol that we're all familiar with. That points to a very systemic problem. Um, and most people don't really understand why it's that way. And so um, just to give you a little bit of context, um, you know, the United States healthcare system specifically uh, was never created. It's not really one system. We talk about it as a system, but, but it is a, a number of disparate companies and organizations providing health care, but we call it the, health, the United States healthcare system. So it was never architected or designed in any way for efficiency. Uh, and until recently, uh, there wasn't a lot that you could do about that. Um, so part of the problem is you have, you know, this country hospital or country doctor, for example, and then you had like a religious organization that, that established a hospital. And uh, they're caring for patients, but they're not interested in sharing information because they're trying to run a business. So Intiva's built an ecosystem. Uh, Mike was talking about ecosystems decentralized ecosystems. And the concept with Intiva uh, from day one uh, was always that the information they're sharing typically is redundant, right? You, you go to one doctor's office and you fill out paperwork, and then you go to another doctor's office and you fill out paperwork, and then another one. You're thinking, you know, can't they share this information? Well, the biggest breakdown is the fact that they are profit-driven not to, right? They want to keep you as a patient individually, hold, hold on to you. Now, this kind of con this concept goes to the back office as well when it comes to dealing with the healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, etc. So Intiva has built a decentralized ecosystem that is actually on the market now that incentivizes and even gamifies, as Michael mentioned with Bitcoin, sharing of information between two completely separate companies. Right now, they're profit-driven to hold on to that information. We have introduced a way for them to profit through efficiencies and also incentivizing them with cryptocurrency tokens. And, and specifically to kind of focus it in, mm -hmm. you, you took a narrow view of the problem and went after the practitioners That's or right. the, the professionals, not necessarily the end user patient because it's a big enough problem as it is, but there was a way to, with a profit motive, mm -hmm create more efficiency so, in doctor verification. That's absolutely like that. correct. And, and when you dig deep into healthcare, what, you, what, you've, what becomes soon evident is that the, because of the way it grew up and because of the structures that have been built within it, um, physicians are truly the tip of the spear and they influence the way healthcare goes. We all want to believe that the patients drive healthcare. Unfortunately, uh, believe it or not, we aren't. Uh, the physicians sit on the boards and they sit on the committees and they manage the budgets and they make the decisions about who's giving care. And then the profit centers or the, uh, the, the hospital organizations listen to them because they're bringing the money in. So you just follow the money and the f money goes to the physicians and, and other uh, licensed medical professionals. So we specifically focused initially to roll out with licensed medical professionals, physicians, and the facilities that they deal with. And then, ultimately, the plan will be to roll out a patient porthole as well. So, without getting into too much detail, uh, I do want to let you know that the, the platform is live, um, and we have just launched the very first um, hash graph